In southern Sudan, there's little food except for that which falls from the sky. It's an aerial lifeline maintained by the UN and humanitarian organizations. Twelve thousand tons of food is parachuted in every month to two million starving people. There was no harvest last year, nor will there be one this year. That's because there were no seeds to sow because they were all eaten. Now the UN is delivering a new supply. Unless the southern Sudanese have a chance to grow their own food, the cycle of famine will never be broken. They sing and dance a thanksgiving for the new opportunity the delivery offers their hungry families. This aid doesn't always reach the people it's intended for. Soldiers of the SPLA guerrillas also get a large share. The Sudan People's Liberation Army will hijack 40% of this food to help them in their war against the Islamic government in the north. For the army, having food to offer is a surefire means of recruiting soldiers. These half-starved people have fled the SPLA's war zones and have walked for days in a convoy of the dying to get to this feeding center in the Bar el Ghazal region. They are the displaced of Sudan and there are around five million of them. The principal cause of famine here is not drought but war. As the front lines of the battle zones shift in annual waves across the countryside, ordinary Sudanese have no opportunity to re-establish their lives and grow food. It's a desperate cycle which has so far killed over a million people. And with the war comes another ancient scourge, slavery. Sudan is one of the few countries where slavery is still endemic. In the anarchic and war-ridden south, it's impossible to control it. Eve flies for charity organizations working in South Sudan. Below is the war-ravaged Upper Nile, ironically an area bursting with oil and gold deposits. It's also the area where the slave caravans pick up their wares, capturing women and children for sale to the wealthy Arabs of northern Sudan. Today, Eve is carrying aid workers to a secret drop deep inside the war zone. It's a six-hour flight, and it's not unusual for such planes to be fired on from below. Also on board is John Eibner, a member of CSI, Christian Solidarity International, a Swiss-based charity. He's taken it upon himself to tackle the slavery issue. CSI's objective is to campaign to bring about a change in the situation in Sudan so that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights are respected for all people. So that is our ultimate goal. We, we work on various fronts to bring about that kind of change so that human rights are, are, according to international norms, are respected across the board. The slavery uh, activity was something that we discovered on our own in 1995 when we went into an area that had just been devastated by slave raids. And in that particular raid, uh, over 80 uh, men had been killed, over 280 women and children had been uh, enslaved. We saw the devastation, we spoke to the, the victims. John Eibner and his team have come to collect evidence of slave trading. The Dinka of the area describe murderous raids from hundreds of rampaging horsemen dressed in white who stream down from the Islamic north. The, the massive raids took place in, uh, well, from April to the beginning of June. That is when the military action was going on. We were here in both May and June and documented the raids but we did not at that time know where the slaves were being taken. And uh, it was when we came back in September, well actually we had heard, but we did not have a chance to speak to anybody uh, about their experience. We had heard that some of the slaves were taken to concentration camps, but it was last September that we first met with uh, people who had either been 
captives in um, such a concentration camp or those who have visited to help them get away. So from different sources, we had first-hand evidence of uh, the situation in this concentration camp. John wants to secure the release of these slaves and negotiates with a trader who buys slaves back from the rich Arabs to sell to aid workers like John. After a deal is struck, the camp prepares to meet the trader the day after tomorrow. Well, we're going now to meet with uh, the trader and slaves. We understand that there are 320 slaves that have recently come back with one trader and we'll, we'll go to meet with him. It's about, it'll take us about an hour to get, uh, get to him. And then later this afternoon, there are two other uh, networks of traders that we will, will meet. The meeting is arranged for a secret location deep in the savannah. Secret because the go-betweens are afraid of government reprisals. Because they're heading towards the front line, an escort from the SPLA, the Christian Rebel Army, accompanies them. Despite having a four-wheel drive, the effects of the rainy season make the roads impassable. After battling with the thick mud, they finally give up. The only way John and his team can maintain their rendezvous with the traders is to continue on foot. It takes them three hours to get to Warawa, the last stop before John's secret meeting. Warawa is a unique place. Both the Christian Dinkas and the Arabs have surprisingly agreed a fragile sort of peace here. Reprisals have come from the Islamic government who are unhappy about the pact and have bombed here several times. These images were taken in June 1997, a few kilometers from Warawa. The village was attacked by horsemen again dressed in white, the Murahilins sent by the Khartoum regime. The government in the north denies slavery even exists, but the reality is they cannot afford to pay their army, so they allow them to live off the spoils of war, cattle and slavery. The villages were pillaged and burned, the churches ransacked, and the priests maimed or executed. The soldiers took the women and children. The men were considered unsuitable for slavery and were executed. team arrive at the meeting place and a trail of slaves emerge from the bush. A silent caravan of over 300. They've been walking for several days. At the front is Anur, the Arab trader. He's purchased the slaves from their captors at $50 each. Anur has been buying back slaves for 10 years. Families looking for their children and who have the money turn to him. Increasingly, he's retrieving slaves on behalf of John Eibner and Christian Solidarity. It's a controversial practice. Is this man exploiting the spoils of war by trading in human beings, or is he saving their lives? He claims he opposes the Islamic government and takes risks by trading in slaves. Last year, he only just escaped death when government forces attacked his home. Their real names are Luau, Rebecca, Akok, Agel, but in the north, they were given Arab names. Some of them have even forgotten their native Dinka language. Before John can come to an agreement with the trader, he has to agree a price for the total number of slaves. Even though the number is higher than anticipated, the trader will free them for the initial price. 
Many of these people have endured tremendous suffering during their captivity. I live with my parents in a village. One day we heard gunshots and ran away. My father escaped first with the cattle to shelter them. There was more gunfire and people were getting killed all around us. We tried to escape, but the Arabs caught us. They made us walk in a long column towards the north. Later we caught up with my father, who'd been taken away along with the cattle. He didn't have the strength to walk anymore, so they shot him in front of me. I was abducted in May. They made me carry heavy loads. They raped me. I had to do all the housework. They beat me and I had nowhere to rest or sleep. Often I had to sleep in the kitchen. The master's wife was the kindest to me, but he was horrible. He would secretly rape me at night. They gave me very little food, just leftovers. The master made me pregnant with this child I'm holding now. I spent three years in captivity at the home of the man who bought me, Mohammed Fadul. If you were captured with a brother or close relative, they would automatically separate you. If you refuse to work, they would beat you and throw you in prison. At the master's home, even if you fell ill, you had to work without food and above all without complaining. One day, we heard there was someone coming to buy back the slaves. This trader came and talked to our master for a long time, who at first refused to let us go. After lengthy dealings, we were finally freed. He paid for us to be set free, but I don't know how much. I don't know whether anyone has told you why we are here. We have been working for a long time to help the slaves of Sudan go from the north and from their bondage and captivity to their families in Bar al Ghazal. And we hope through, through this exercise that we will help bring about an end to slavery for all time in Sudan. In just a few minutes, we will speak with the trader, Noor. And if we do reach agreement, if he is happy to confirm our longstanding agreement with him, then you will be free to go back to your, to your homes today. <laughs> Not every slave can be bought back by charities like CSI. Often children, because of their usefulness to the government, make negotiations more difficult. During the raids, the Islamic organizations recruit children to be forcibly enrolled in specialist training camps. From there, they're sent to the front line, to Pakistan, Iran, Afghanistan. We cannot accept this, so we free them, sometimes at great risk. There are no set prices for these transactions. It's down to the goodwill of the owner. If he doesn't want to sell, we'll bid higher and go up to 20,000 or 100,000 Sudanese pounds for a slave. The transactions take place in secret and are on-the-spot cash payments. Then we make our way to the safest areas where government representatives will be unable to track us down. However, at some stages of the journey to freedom, we are attacked and shot at by soldiers or paramilitaries. During these clashes, there are casualties, and often it's the children who are killed. One million. Two million. Four hundred thousand. 
Each of these bundles represents $1,000, the price of liberty for 20 people. Seven million. Some observers have criticized the bargaining and payment for slaves by charities such as CSI. They say they're making the situation worse and are responsible for the rising number of slave raids. At this moment, 328 people are freed and the mood in the camp changes. Freedom, or what's left of it. Some of them, after their ordeals, have lost the will or the ability to live. They beat me constantly. The master raped me. He didn't give me enough food, and I had nowhere to rest. When night fell, the master came with several friends to rape me. I feel bad, really bad. It's certainly because of the cruelty and ill treatment. They tried to poison me several times. I don't have the courage to carry on living. I feel dishonored. Yes, well, this boy was captured in the slave raid about uh, two, three years ago. And on the way north, he was uh, first tied on a horse and then put down. And he was very young and could not keep up with the rest of the people. And one of the soldiers took a stick and beat him. And you can see how he was wounded around the eye and is now blind. He's lost the sight of his one eye. He said that the other soldiers were saying, beat him, beat him, uh, and let him die if he, if he dies while the beating took place. He was taken to the north, uh, placed in domestic uh, servitude as a, as a slave. And then his master took him to a uh, Quranic school uh, near Adila. And there he was uh, abused in many ways. He was beaten. Uh, once he was asked to take a horse to uh, give it some water. And one of the teachers was dissatisfied with the way that he did it. And then his legs uh, were placed in chains. And he had to uh, hop around. Uh, with chains on his feet for two days and had bad wounds and scars as a result of the, the, uh, the chaining. And he has so many emotions that are bubbling around in, inside of him. On the one hand, he's happy to be back and relieved to, to be here. He's very happy with the trader Ahmed who brought him back and was so kind. He expects to see his family. He's very excited about it. Yet he still has all of these bad memories and still fears that perhaps They'll come back and take it. For the Dinkas, these liberations are also seen as victories over their oppressors. As if to defy their enemies and show their bravery, the warriors sing until dusk. <laughs> But many former slaves will find it hard to trace their families who've been decimated at the hands of the Islamic army. At best, their relatives will be scattered across the region. Many of those slaves returning will discover their family members are dead. Arek is lucky. As one of the returning slaves, she's finally been reunited with her sister. <laughs> My sister heard I might be among the slaves who'd just been freed, and she came to find out. She saw I was among the women and the men who'd just arrived. She recognized me from a distance and threw herself into my arms, crying, My God, it's so wonderful that you're alive. <laughs> Oh, 
Now she's back. I'm very happy. I was sure she was dead. It was amazing to find her like that, just by chance. Now, my biggest problem is her illness. It's getting worse, especially now with the famine. Little by little, life in the village returns to normal. After two years of anguish, a mother sees her children again. For her, it's a miracle, a priceless gift from heaven, in spite of everything her two boys have suffered. In the master's house, I ate leftovers and slept in the cow shed. Every day it was the same. They forced me to go to the mosque and made me pray. They were really horrible. If I refused, I was beaten and punished. I'm very happy, even though my children have come back with wounds and scars. The most important thing is that they're alive. I was so unhappy when they were abducted. Having them alive beside me, I'm as happy as only a mother can be. These wounds on my legs are from the chains. One day, as I was looking after the horses, one of them ran away. When the master saw, he beat me very hard and put chains on my feet. I wore them for two years. No one knows how many more slaves still remain in the north. According to Arab merchants and humanitarian organizations, there could be tens of thousands. Shortly after talking to us, Alak, the child whose legs had been mutilated by chains, got up and with an old bicycle wheel, did something he hadn't been able to do for two years. He played. <laughs> <laughs> 